I mean, you want me to? All right, we are going to get started in just a moment. I hope that you can all hear me okay. If you're having any issues, please do let us know. There is a poll just posted, so please go ahead and uh, complete that as you're uh, waiting for the session to begin in just a moment. So it looks like most of you don't know much about the GMAT, just getting started. That's a good place to be. Started studying, that's good. Great. This is a good session to join if you are at the beginning or if you're in the middle and you are already well on your way. This is also uh, going to be very informative and provide some good tips and advice. By my time, I have 12 o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Don't worry if you feel you've missed anything. Uh, there will be. Um, a recording. So you will have uh, this recording available to you within the next two to three business days, which you'll be able to share and watch at your own time. So I'm going to get started with uh, a brief overview of our full-time MBA program at the Smith School of Business. Um, this is a program that begins in January. So just in a few short weeks, we're still recruiting domestically. So if you are a candidate still interested in joining the program and you feel prepared and ready and you're on your way uh, to writing your GMAT in the next couple of weeks, then please don't hesitate to reach out. Again, it is not too late to apply for our January intake if you are a domestic student or a student who already has permanent residency. So your hosts today are going to be myself. I am the Associate Director of Recruitment and Admissions for the full-time MBA at the Smith School of Business. And my name is Teresa Perez, and I'm joined here by Sergey Cook, who's a Senior Trainer and Admissions Coach at Admitmaster. So Sergey will be joining us in just a, a few moments. 
um, to walk you through how to beat the GMAT test and provide you some great tips and advice um, on the GMAT itself. So as you may be aware, um, our program, the Smith School of Business, Queen's University is located in Kingston, Ontario. Um, if you are someone who's never been to Kingston before, it is situated between Toronto, Montreal, and our capital, Ottawa, which is only an hour and a half away. So very centrally located uh, between major cities. It is a very dynamic city, a small city, about 140,000 people, uh, Kingston surrounding area. It offers you great amenities and resources, attractions, etc. It is also very diverse and welcoming environment for students from across the globe. We have been ranked number one for best quality of life, as well as number one for uh, women to live as well. So great um, points there to highlight about Kingston, which is where our full-time MBA is based. So it is a residential MBA. So we do not have an online program. You are required to be on campus for the 12 months. You are uh, going to be in Goods Hall. So if you are familiar with Queen's University, Goods Hall um, is a beautiful building with that old Victoria schoolhouse um, and uh, the uh, extensions on either end uh, of the building. That is Goods Hall, where you would be studying for the 12 months of the full-time MBA program. And as previously mentioned, it does begin in January each year with one intake. It is a very walkable campus. So Queen's University is situated in, in downtown uh, historic Kingston, so everything is walkable. It's also a very safe environment and inexpensive in comparison to major cities. So in terms of our class profile, we recruit approximately 80 students per year. Currently, we have 78 students in the class. 28 is the average age. Around four and a half to five years is the average years of work experience. And the range typically with work experience is two to nine years. Your 10 plus years of work experience, generally speaking, you'd be considering an executive option at that point. We do recruit approximately 40% international students year over year. Uh, we do have a very uh, wide uh, representation of nationalities, 19 nationalities represented in this co current cohort. And I just want to highlight that there's no specific background in terms of work experience or education. We see candidates from a very wide range of education backgrounds, engineering, right down to healthcare, technology, uh, social sciences. We are looking for diverse experiences, both in what you've done uh, professionally as well as personally. The things I do want to highlight is that we do have a blended methodology. So we're not focused on just one way of teaching. We have a variety of ways of uh, learning and teaching within our program. So we try and merge uh, the technical expertise that you get in some of the curriculum, the courses that you're going to be taking, but also we build in time for you to build your personal skill set. So your interpersonal skills, your interview skills, et cetera, are all uh, embedded into the curriculum meaning that we have courses in uh, professional communication skills, as well as our Career Advancement Center actually offers a program. So it's the careers program that happens in the first six months of the MBA to really prepare you for those next opportunities. Many of our students are looking to transition jobs. And so it's important that you consider how you're applying to those jobs. What skills do you need to have to be successful in those jobs? And that's ultimately um, what we're trying to do is build you up for professionally as well as uh, personally and throughout uh, the curriculum technically as well. So you're going to have a variety of different experiential learning opportunities, a real world business projects where you're working with SMEs, small to medium sized enterprises. There's going to be computer simulations, living cases, uh, lots of case-based uh, methodology within uh, the curriculum as well. And then of course, class discussion. So we are a small program, 80 students, so everyone is in class together. We do not split up the cohorts. Um, so you do get to know your faculty members very well, as well as your peers throughout the course. We do have an opportunity for you to go on exchange. So this is a great opportunity if you are looking to get some global exposure outside, of course, of the classroom. As I previously mentioned, there is a lot of diversity in terms of the nationalities represented. But if you are looking to take a course that maybe we don't offer, uh, for example, Bocconi offers a luxury brand program, um, London Business School, some FinTech courses that you can take there. So uh, there is a great opportunity to go abroad, get some uh, courses under your belt, and then come back and return to Canada to uh, get that placement uh, post-MBA job opportunity. 
<clears throat> so who is recruiting at Smith? This is just a short list. Uh, we see candidates move into a variety of different industries. Um, we are currently seeing an increase in healthcare and technology, um, but the traditional finance and consulting opportunities are there for every student as well. So the way it works is that I've mentioned we have a careers programming built in. Uh, you are um, assigned a career coach based on the type of industry you're looking to move into. So it is a functional alignment and you're working very diligently with your career coach to help prepare you for those job opportunities that you're seeking. Um, so there are going to be a variety of different events and activities that are happening throughout the year, both virtually as well as um, in-person events. So both at our Toronto campus and on campus in Kingston. So there's lots of great opportunities for you to uh, engage with corporates and alumni. Our employment outcomes are some of the strongest numbers you'll see across Canada of any MBA program. Uh, we have seen a great um, transition between candidates that have no industry experience in consulting or finance and make that leap into those industries. So if that is a concern, I'm trying to alleviate that and showing you some statistics here. Uh, you can see here employment outcomes by industry, consulting is up there, financial services, consumer goods, um, and you can just go down the list there. But most importantly, just a quote from Andrew Liu, who is currently working at the Boston Consulting Group. He was in the BFL prior to coming into the MBA. So uh, certainly there were a lot of transferable skills that he was able to utilize to be successful in the MBA and to make that transition into consulting. And that's ultimately what we do in our Smith MBA program is help make those transitions happen for you. If you are looking to make a big leap, that is why we have that functional alignment in the career coaching that we offer you. So return on your investment, you can see here that we have the best at career outcomes, 96% accepted and offered before graduation. All right, so that is huge. Before graduation, our program starts in January, ends in December, you're graduating in May of the following year. So between that time frame, 96%, almost 100% of our students um, accepted a job offer. And by three months after graduation, we were at 100%. Um, so this is, this is a great uh, return on your investment in terms of the numbers. Um, 135,000 uh, average total compensation, and then the top base salary was $200,000. You can see here that 93% of grads made at least one career transition. We post over a thousand job opportunities for MBAs and we hosted 160 employer events last year. So we keep you very busy throughout the program, but lots of opportunity for you to ensure that you're getting those networking opportunities to engage with industry leaders throughout the year. To pivot slightly, um, our price or our cost of tuition is an all-inclusive fee. So you are expected to pay 83,000 for domestic and 104 for international. And this includes all of your cases, tuition, textbooks, all of those resources in terms of the coaching that you're offered is all included. The additional costs are your living expenses. So keep that in mind. Uh, living in case is quite inexpensive in comparison to major cities. So please do your due diligence and ensure that you're um, looking into the total cost of an MBA um, throughout that uh, process of applying. Uh, we're happy to connect with you and uh, provide you more information about uh, what it's like uh, to live in Kingston, connect you with a current student, and as well uh, provide you more information about our scholarships. So they're all merit-based primarily, so we're looking at everything that you're submitting to us to make a decision um, on what you'll be awarded. Uh, we do also uh, look at candidates with strong quantitative skills, so hence why you're here today to ensure you do very well on the GMAT. Um, test. Uh, we do uh, expect to see uh, 600 plus on the GMAT, 650 or above. Uh, we'll surely, surely uh, ensure that we are uh, looking at you for one of our top scholarships. So our scholarships range from 10000 up to $70,000. And again, keep in mind, we do have some fellowships. So Forte is for women uh, fellows looking to uh, promote women in business, um, as well as uh, be an ambassador for, for women seeking an MBA. Then we have the Reaching Out MBA fellowships uh, for those in the the LGBTQ community, Black and Indigenous scholarships. So please, if you identify as um, filling in, fitting into one of those uh, categories, please do let us know on the application. So just some quick facts as I wrap up uh, before I turn it over to Sergey. Uh, we are a 12-month program. We begin in January each year, one intake of about 80 students. Uh, we do see over 40 females, which is fantastic, and we consistently have seen over 35% over the last five cycles. Uh, you are required to have a GMAT or a GRE, so we do not uh, waive uh, candidates from having the standardized test unless you have the CFA designation. 
Uh, so please keep that in mind. Um, approximately 120 average starting salary package. And as you just saw, uh, $200,000 is the base total package. Um, all inclusive tuition. So all of your materials and events are all included. And we don't have a specific deadline. We are enrolling admissions for domestic students and for permanent residents. If you are an international student, ideally you are applying before September in any given year. I have a contact me, um, both my LinkedIn and my email. Please jot that down. If you have any further questions, you can always reach out to me directly and I'd be happy to answer any and all of your questions. I wanna wish you all the best in your uh, GMAT preparation. And now I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Survey. Thank you so much, Teresa. And thanks everyone for joining us here today. Let me switch our slides. And uh, please let me know in the chat box if you could see the slides. I'm just going to do this in one moment. Right. So this is it. Please let me know if you can see the slides well. You can see perfectly, Sergey. Can see perfectly. Okay. All right. Let me make sure that everybody can actually type in the chat. Okay. Here we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So as Sergei, Teresa said, my name is Sergei. I'm a senior trainer with Admit Master. And the goal for the next 45 minutes or so would be to really share with you some of the practical strategies of how you can do really well in the GMAT and how you can get a score of 600, 650, or maybe even over 700. Now, how exactly are we going to do this? I will show you a few strategies just to pick your interest and show you what the GMAT's really all about, because many people misunderstand the test. And honestly, if we can spend only 45 minutes today and we never speak again, at least I would like for you to have a better understanding of what to expect on the GMAT and how you should study for the GMAT. Because surprisingly, many, many people do not study properly for the GMAT and that's why they're not successful. So let's take a look at a couple of GMAT questions and I'll show you what they are and what they're not. Here's the first question. It is going to be a problem solving question from the quantitative section. We'll talk about the structure of the test in a moment. Here's what the question says. The ratio of pigs to chickens on a certain farm is 13 to 28. When 15 pigs were added to the farm, the ratio of pigs to chickens became four to seven. What was the original total number of pigs and chickens on this farm? So it looks uh, maybe complicated. Maybe you are starting to remember some of your math from the middle school and the high school. But guess what? You don't actually have to solve the problem because this is a multiple choice exam. You can look at the answers and tell me perhaps what you think is the right answer. Can anybody just uh, maybe take a wild guess and type in the chat box, what do you think is the right answer to this question? I'll give you about 30 seconds. So either this is a hard question or everybody on the, on the meeting is very shy, but don't worry. I will talk about this question in a moment. So, if you are trying to remember what you've learned in school, you probably will remember some theory, theory about ratios. Most specifically, when you have a ratio of 13 to 28, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have 13 pigs and 28 chickens. What you will actually have is what's called the multiple of 13 and 28. So you don't need to have necessarily 13 and 28, you will have 13 times n and 28 times n. So this is the actual number of pigs and chickens. Now you don't actually know what n is, you just know that this is how the ratio works. These numbers are supposed to be 13 n and 28 n for the ratio to work and n is some sort of an integer number, a whole number. So therefore that means that we start with 13 n pigs and 28 n chickens. So now we're asked to add 15 pigs to the farm. So we kind of like playing the role of a farmer, right? You were thinking you were trying to get into a business school. Here's a question about pigs and chickens on a farm. So we'll get to this in a moment. Uh, this is not a coincidence. 
So if we're adding 15 picks now, all of a sudden we have more picks. 13 and plus 15 is the new number. The number of chickens hasn't changed. So the new ratio will then become 13 and plus 15 divided by 28 and we are told that that is four over seven. This is a new ratio. So now if you're comfortable with linear equations, you can try to simplify this equation and actually solve for m. It's not extremely hard as long as you know what you're doing. So usually after about three minutes or so, figuring out what to do and solving this equation, most people would have an answer. And the answer would be five, assuming they don't make any mistakes. So that means that we have 13 times five picks, which is 65, 28 times five chickens, which is 140. And if we add them up, the answer will be two or five. And the answer is B. So the correct answer was actually B. And if you got B, that's great. I actually noticed that, that Teresa, you got B, that's amazing. So this is a perfectly valid approach to solving this question. In fact, this is exactly what your high school teacher taught you. And uh, we all worked really hard in school to get good marks, right? So I call this approach the work hard approach. But on the GMAT, you want to get the right answer without actually maybe working as hard. What instead you want to do is you want to work smart because you have very limited time and the questions get harder and harder. So let's call this work smart way the mastery way. And I'll explain what the difference is and why do we call it the mastery way as opposed to the theory way or the work hard way. So here's what was given to us. We know that for every 13 picks, we have 28 chickens. And just like we said before, that means you might have 13 picks and 28 chickens. You also might have 130 picks and 280 chickens. You could also have 26 pigs and 56 chickens. We do not know exactly how many pigs and chickens we have, but what we do know is that the total number of pigs must be a multiple of 13, and the total number of chickens must be a multiple of 28. The only way the ratio of 13 to 28 is going to work is if we have a multiple of 13 and a multiple of 28. You remember this from the theory. So the theory is a good stepping stone, but let's go one step further. And let's actually understand what this means on a more conceptual level. Let's try to reduce the mass and increase the thinking. So here's what we can draw from this. If I know my number of pigs is divisible by 13 and the number of chickens divisible by 28, the number of total animals on this farm, pigs and chickens, must be a multiple of 13 plus 28, which is 41. So now let me ask you a question. How many answer choices are divisible by 41? Remember the question was asking us about the original number of total pigs and chickens on the farm. We just found out that that number should be divisible by 41. The answer choices are pretty close to each other. Certainly the difference between them is small enough to be sure that only one of these answers is a multiple of 41. We just have to find it. And 41 is almost 40. 40 times five is 200, one times five is five. So the answer is very clearly B, 205. And we can do this in literally 30 seconds without working hard, but we have worked smart. Hope you enjoyed this question. Let's take a look at the verbal reasoning question. So you'll see, this is not just about math. In fact, many people think that math is about solving the problems. Verbal is just about going by what sounds right. So as you already see here in this question, we didn't actually solve the problem. We logically found the answer. So let's try to do the same for verbal. I'll give you about 30 seconds to read this question. Okay, let me ask you a question. 
just please type yes or no in the chat box. Do you feel like at this point you can answer this question? It's okay to say yes, and it's also okay to say no. Don't worry, I'm not gonna hold it against you. Just let me know if you think you can answer this question at this point. In fact, all the information you need to answer this question is actually in front of you. Hmm. Okay, let me ask you another question, a simpler question. How many times have you read this passage in about a minute that I've given you? Have you read it once? Have you read it twice? Let me see what's going on here in the chat box. Okay, I see people are saying, well, I've read this three times or four times. So this is a question that's a little confusing, right? But again, this is a multiple choice exam. So now that we've read it two, three or four times, let me show you the answer choices. And once you see the answer choices, let me know if you think you can answer this question now. And what do you think would be the answer? So if you think you know what the answer is, just please type it in the chat box. All right, well, again, another challenging question, right? So let's go back to the question and see what's going on here. The question was an argument. In fact, the question is below the argument. Here's what the question says. The statement above in both phase plays, which of the following roles in the ethicist's argument? So this gives me a little bit of an idea of what exactly I'm going to be looking for when I'm reading the passage. So I like to read this first, and then let's read the passage. The passage is an argument by an ethicist. By the way, don't know if you've ever met a person by the professional ethicist. Oh, hi, what are you doing? Oh, I'm an ethicist. Wow, that's amazing. Never heard of this person. Who's an ethicist? Well, that's probably a university professor who studies ethics maybe in like a political science uh, program. Now, let me ask you a question. You're trying to get into a business school. How much do you need to know about ethics? Let me know on a scale of zero to 10, how much do you need to know about ethics if you're trying to get into a top business school like Smith? You think you need to know a lot about ethics? You have to be an expert in ethics? I would argue you need to be ethical, but you don't necessarily need to be an expert in ethics, certainly not to the degree that this person is, the ethicist. So when most people read this passage, they try to focus on understanding what in the world is this person saying? All of this subject matter about ethics. But again, just like we said, you don't have to be an expert in ethics. So how come the GMAT asks us a question about ethics? Because the question isn't about ethics. It's about the role of a statement. So if we want to understand the role of a statement, we are going to be reading very differently. We've been trained by a mantra that knowledge is power and therefore we should read something and absorb the knowledge from this passage. The knowledge is about ethics. But your job is not to understand the ethics, your job is to answer the question. In order to answer the question, you need to focus on very different keywords than people who want to understand ethics. You will be focusing on the keywords that tell you what the roles the statements could play. In fact, these are the keywords that describe the roles of different statements, ultimately describe the structure of the passage. We begin by saying it would be a mistake to say something. So that's what we call the claim of an argument. The author is saying, these people are wrong, I'm right. In a good argument, I also need to explain why am I right? So what follows after that is actually my, what's called evidence. So for although this is true, this will be a piece of evidence that's brought by the author to actually explain why he or she believes whatever was said before. 
The question was about the part in bold. So we've already determined this is evidence to the main claim of the argument. And we also can see that there are, of course, different ways to use the evidence. We can use examples or counterexamples or analogies. In this specific case, the author is actually saying, yeah, you know what? This is right. Yeah, I agree with these people. This is definitely true. No question about that. However, these people still misunderstand what's going on here. And the conclusion they draw, the opinion they draw is actually wrong. So something they're saying is right, but their opinion is still wrong. So now let's see if this will actually help us answer the question. Remember the question was about the part and bolt. So the part and bolt, what is it doing? Well, the most popular answer when I'm doing this question in the live class would be answer to C. So why don't we take a look at C? It says it is a faulty claim. Okay, so was there a faulty claim in the argument? Yes or no? Yes, there was. Was the part in bold a faulty claim? No, it wasn't. Remember we said this is evidence that supports the author's claim. It's not a claim itself and it's certainly not faulty, so we can get rid of C. Let's take a look at D. It is according to the argument, again, what it is, the part in bold is, according to the argument, a commonly held opinion that is nevertheless false. That is not true. It is not false. It is actually true. The author said, for although this is true, right? So how could we claim it's false if the author said it's true? So let's keep going. Let's actually go to E. E says, it reports an observation that the argument claims is false. Okay, let's stop right here. Again, claims is false. I don't have to keep reading this answer choice. I already know it's wrong. So now I'm actually down to two answer choices, A and B. Only one of them could be correct. Again, I want to be efficient with my time. So I don't even have to read both of them. I'll just read one of them. I'll read answer choice A. I just want to be lazy. Answer choice A says, it is a claim for which the argument attempts to provide justification. So was the part in bold a claim to which the argument attempts to provide justification? Yes or no? No, it wasn't. The part in bold was the evidence to the claim. It was supporting the claim. So A is certainly not the right answer. B has to be the right answer. And that is absolutely the correct answer to this question. Now, if you ask me, what did this person try to say about ethics? I'll say, uh, I was teaching this question for many years. I got no idea. I don't need to know that because I'm a GMAT test taker. In fact, I'm a GMAT instructor. My job is to teach you how to answer the question, not to teach you ethics. That's why you're gonna have your ethics professors in the business school. So this question or these couple of questions bring up a very important point, And that is what really separates people from get, let's say scores of 500 from people who get scores of let's say 700. And the difference really is in this, and this is very important. And this is a quote by people who make the test the GMAT, here's what they say. Rather than testing your knowledge of business or any other subject matter, for example, farming or philosophy, instead the GMAT exam is a skills-based exam. You would notice that as we were doing this question, we were using our reasoning skills, our logical skills, what the GMAT calls the higher order reasoning skills. So it's something that isn't traditionally taught in a business school. But these skills do really matter in the management classrooms and 21st century workplace. Why many top business schools would come and recruit on campus of top business schools such as Smith? Because they know that people who get into schools have gone through this rigorous selection process, have done the GMAT, did really well, beat a lot of people on the test, and then have gone through extensive skills-based training. The MBA program isn't just about reading a book about accounting. If you want to read a book on accounting, you can go on Amazon or chapters and buy the book for $20. That's not why we're doing MBA program. The MBA program is about developing a new skill set. And when you're applying to a business school and when you're applying to a job, you will need to demonstrate you have the relevant skill set. When you're applying to the business school, the GMAT will help you demonstrate that you have the relevant skill set. Of course, it's not the only criterion. You have to pass the interview and write your statement of purpose and so on and so forth. But when you're applying to a job, if you've ever applied for a job, you probably would have noticed that the job 
advertisements usually have a section called skills. This, these are the skills we want our candidates to have. And by the way, just for the record, the job advertisements usually do not contain the section called knowledge, unless it's a very technical job, but certainly not more of a leadership job. In fact, I used to work for Bell Canada, which is a telecommunications company. I would argue that I knew more about telecommunications, about the actual technology than the CEO. And yet CEO was making in a day what I was making in a year. Because this is not about the knowledge, this is about the skills. Just like we mentioned, we've been trained that knowledge is power. Our high school teachers told us that knowledge is power. And when we grow up, as long as we learn that history lesson or that biology lesson, when we grow up, we'll be very powerful. Right? I remember my teachers told me that, my history teacher. Wow, I really loved her. And this is almost as ridiculous as to say, if I want to learn how to swim, all I have to do is read the book on swimming. I don't know if any of you guys have watched the Big Bang Theory, even season two, Sheldon was going around trying to convince everyone he knows how to swim because he just read the book on swimming. And of course, everybody believed him, right? The same thing on the GMAT. If you want to learn how to swim, you have to do it. You have to study, you have to, show up at the gym, show up at the training session, get some coaching, overcome some of your mistakes, overcome some of your challenges and get to the next level. The GMAT is a mental sport. It is not a traditional exam where you cram a book the night before, I've certainly done it and I can imagine you may have done that too. The GMAT is something where you have to train for this exam and it takes some time. That's why Teresa was saying, if you're almost ready to take your test, perfect. You can still apply for the January program. If you haven't started yet, well, my advice would be take a practice test. And if you're close, that's perfect. Go and take your test and still apply for the January program. But if you're not close yet the way you need to be, chances are you might need to give it some time to actually develop these skills. And I'll show you exactly how you can do that. So now, when we're talking about skills versus knowledge, I've shown you the quote from the GMAT, but I wanted to show you one more thing. And this is the slide that was shown to us by the GMAT again. Uh, we belong to a very small group of organizations that get invited to visit the GMAT headquarters every year. So it's a very, very exclusive conference that is invitation only. And we're very fortunate to be one of the organizations that the GMAT understands and appreciates uh, the kind of work that we do. So they share ideas and uh, they tell us some interesting things about the test. And they also hear from us how our students are doing and what strategies work for them. So this is one of these conferences. This is what they showed us when people in the audience were saying, well, how do we really tell people what the GMAT's all about? They say, well, you know what? All you have to do is show them the structure of the test and then ask them what's a pattern in the naming of the sections. Because many people mistakenly believe that the GMAT's all about maybe knowing math and knowing some English. But you know what? Honestly, and you can ask your research, you can keep me honest, it's not really important for you to know the area of a trapezoid when you get to the business school. And if the GMAT were an English test, then we wouldn't need IELTS or TOEFL if you are coming not from an English speaking country. So the GMAT is not about that. It is really about demonstrating your reasoning skills. It is a competitive exam. That's why the scores are used by the business schools for actually two things. Number one is to select the best candidates. And number two is to see whether you're ready for the MBA program. Because if someone cannot score well on the GMAT, most likely that means the person doesn't have good studying skills or not committed, not dedicated enough. And that probably means they will not do well in a business school. And certainly, the business school, the good business schools such as Smith do not want anyone to come to the school and fail. So you have to be prepared. And guess what? If you're not prepared yet, you can prepare. It's totally okay. None of us were born with these skills. You just have to take the time to get ready. The MBA program is a once in a lifetime opportunity and you certainly don't want to squander it. So you want to be very well prepared. Now, if you're interested to dig a little bit more into what actually will show up on the GMAT, then you can come and visit us. This is a very short seminar today, about 45 minutes uh, for the GMAT part. 
But if you're interested to learn more, you can come and do and join our GMAT Master Refresher or GMAT Verbal Refresher class. You can go on adminmaster.com and check out the schedule. These are two hour classes that we offer in the evenings on the Eastern time zone. And if you are not able to join, then please register anyway. We are going to send you a recording if you are registered, but you're not able to join. There's something also very important for us to understand about the test, that this is a computer adaptive test. That means that when you're doing some questions, many people would open up a book, do a few questions, say, okay, I feel pretty good. Uh, these questions are easy. What they don't realize is questions at the beginning of the book are easy. Questions at the end of the book are hard. And if you're using the older version of the official exam, before the GMAC started ordering the questions in the, uh, by the difficulty level, sometimes you do like a random question in the middle and it was super easy and the next question super hard. So how do you actually understand where you stand? That's why it's hard to predict your score unless you do a practice test because the GMAT is using what's called the computer adaptive algorithm. When you're doing a question, the next question is going to be picked from a database based on how well you answered the previous question. If you answer that question correctly, generally the next question is going to get harder. If you answer that question incorrectly, generally the next question is going to get easier. So the difficulty of the question is going to keep going up and down, as you can see on the screen. And as a result, people who want very good scores, high scores, will have to deal with a lot of very hard questions. Imagine you're walking into the exam and you know some people are going to get the easy questions and some people are going to get the hard questions, right? The normal logic would say, I want the easy question so I can get an easy mark. But on the GMAT, that's not going to work. The only way to get a good score is to deal with hard questions. And for the record, you are not getting more time compared to somebody who is dealing with an easy question. So the question then becomes, OK, well, you know, how do I prepare for the test? By the way, I will show you one more question today where you look at this question and you'll say, OK, this is hard, but it's actually very easy. So I'll ask you to actually let me know what you think, how hard is that question? But let's talk about the resources and then I'll show you this question. So there are different, different resources. There's so many resources. In fact, if you were to read every single resource for the GMAT, you'll probably be able to do your test when you are hundred years old. But of course, by then even more resources will be created. And that's why most people will never do the test. I'll show you some very interesting statistics. So because there are different resources, we have to be a little focused. So perhaps let me share with you how my preparation worked. And maybe you can do the same thing. Again, this is not necessarily for everyone, but it does work for some people. It didn't work for me. When I needed to do my test, when I decided to apply to my MBA program, I had about two months before the deadline. Usually not something that you should do as close to the deadline. But for me, I had about two months and I said, OK, what the heck? I need to do a couple of tests, the TOEFL and the GMAT. I looked up the GMAT, the score was 200 to 800. And I said, the best way for me to figure out where do I stand was of course to take a practice test. When I did my practice test in the 2000s, this practice test was available in, as a software that worked on MS-DOS, just to give you an idea. But it was a computer-based exam at that time. I did my first practice test and the score was 650. By the way, the exam has changed a little but the algorithm behind the exam actually hasn't changed for many, many years. So 650, that's why the scores are still comparable. 650, 10, 20 years ago is still 650 today. So I got 650 and then I wondered why wouldn't I get a higher score? So I looked up some of the questions I got wrong and I realized I was missing some theory. So I went, I opened the book. In fact, I opened the ABA.com website. I didn't even buy a book. I looked up some questions, I looked up some theory, and then a week later, I tried the next practice test. Now I felt more confident. I've already done it once, and my practice score now was 700. But okay, for the school where I wanna go, this is a pretty good score. I booked my real test, and a week later, I got 750 on the real test. I was walking out of the test, and people were like, wow, you got a 750. I'm like, really? mm, what does this mean? That's just to tell you. It's only been two weeks since I started doing anything related to the GMAT. And I'm telling this to you not to impress you. Honestly, uh, it impresses me. I had certainly impressed people at the test center. And here's, by the way, my official score report just to show you that everything's legit. 
and that's my name and that's my score 750 and you might be wondering okay well of course you know sergey is a genius uh, whatever well let me tell you let me bust some myths here there are lots, lots of myths about the gmat one of the myths is sergey is a genius and that is absolutely not true i am not i'm just a normal guy and i'll tell you how i was able to get a score of 750 what helped me is the strategies I needed for the GMAT, I was learning since I was about nine years old. So it took me many, many years. So when you ask me, how long did I study for the GMAT? I said, for the GMAT, two weeks. But how long did it take me to learn these strategies? Maybe six or seven years. And I've been teaching the GMAT now for 13 years. I'm still learning. That's why when people come to me, I said, well, how come you're doing so much better on the GMAT? Well, not because I'm smarter. I've been doing it for so long. If you do that for 13 years, you'll be pretty good, right? So let me show you so you don't have to waste 13 years learning what I've already learned, or maybe even more years, right? Seven years in school, 13 years as a GMAT instructor. Hey, 20 years, you know, more than some of you were born. So what helped me is I got really lucky in school. And again, I'm telling this to you, not necessarily to just say, okay, well, Sergey is very smart. I'm telling you that sometimes certain strategies work. And if that applies to you, you could certainly repeat my steps and you can also do really well on the GMAT. So I got very lucky. This was my math teacher. He was one of the best teachers I've ever had, if not the best teacher. And certainly the person who I own a lot, uh, a lot of my educational success in life was because of this person. He was just super gifted. Unfortunately, he just recently passed away at the age of 95. So. A lot of the work that I'm doing right now is more of a tribute to my teachers. And by the way, he was so gifted that we had about 25 people in class. Almost everybody did exceptionally well in university, which is, was absolutely crazy. Out of 25 people, everyone but one person made it to the university. And the only reason why this one person didn't actually go to the university because he got married at the age of 17 and he got some other things on the go. So. That took me, to, let's say, 20 years to do really well in the GMAT, or seven years, but it could take you a lot less time. Here's Daria. She joined our class just when the pandemic started, when we started offering the classes virtually. Right now, by the way, we are back in person. So if you are in Toronto, I'm actually in a classroom in Toronto. And this evening, there'll be people here in the class taking the class, and there'll also be people online, just like you, taking this class on the whiteboard, there'll see some slides and we're gonna have fun together. And actually, if you were in our real class, we'll be able to interact because we have a couple of big screen TVs and I'll be able to see your faces, your beautiful faces, see your smile and hear you as well. So that's how we do the class right now. And what I wanted to point out is that Daria, when she came to us, her score, original score was 380, which is, if you understand anything about the scores, it's a terrible score. She wanted to go to a program that required the minimum of 700. It was a master of finance, so very competitive. And it took her three months to get to that score. She was super focused. Said, guys, you know what you're doing? I'm just gonna follow your advice. Tell me exactly what to do, what questions to do, how to do them. I'm just going to repeat after you. I'm gonna get the coaching and I'm going to be very, very dedicated. So three months, she got a score of 700. And she wrote this review on our Google page. Uh, you. Feel free, by the way, to uh, Google us and, and see the different reviews so that you can see the experience of other people. But I love what she said. She said, I learned how to think outside the box. I learned how to manage my time and stress. And I learned how to think like a CEO. This is what we call here at Admit Master thinking on a different level. If you come to our class, we will teach you how the CEOs really think and what do they do and how do they manage their time better and how do they make decisions. And how do they notice things in the question that other people don't notice? And we'll teach you different patterns so that you actually see how you can, yourself can just cut through the GMAT and see through the GMAT. So how can you actually do this? How can you study? If you've been really fortunate with your high school teachers, amazing, you can just do whatever I did. Again, not a genius, I just been lucky. If you were lucky, you can totally do this. But if you're not, that's okay. You can still prepare just like Daria did. So how do we actually prepare? Well, I love analogies and we use lots of analogies in class because that's how we understand, right? If we can relate something or relate a new piece of theory or new strategies to something you already know, you will remember it so much better. So I'm gonna use an analogy of a corn maze. 
Most of us probably remember corn maze. Some of us have children. And you know, I can imagine most of us have been children at some point, right? Just to make sure we're on the same page. So imagine you're walking into a corn maze and uh, you can go either way. You don't actually know where the exit is. So you can go left, you can try things out. If it doesn't work, you can go right, you can try things out. Uh, eventually hit a roadblock, turn around, go back. So this is what we call the trial and error approach. This is how most people study. They try one thing, they go on this YouTube video, they take this course, they talk to this friend, they go to this seminar, uh, and they just see kind of what works, what doesn't work, right? So the trial and error approach is a good approach if you're trying to do something that has never been done before. For example, if you are trying to be Thomas Edison inventing a light bulb, then trial and error is perfect. But if you're trying to do a standardized test, then uh, perhaps the trial and error approach is not the best approach. This is what most people do because we are creatures of habit. Saying, okay, an exam, how do I study for the exam? Okay, in school, I learned that to study for the exam, I need to get a book and cram. That's what most people do. So they get the books, maybe these books, the official guide, and uh, they do some questions, read the explanations. They're terrible, by the way, the explanations. The questions are good, the explanations are bad because this is really the question bank. This is a book published by the GMAC, not to teach you how to beat the test, obviously. There would be a conflict of interest just to show you what shows up on the test and to maybe very theoretically explain why this is the right answer. Sometimes they take like 10 minutes to explain why this is the right answer, but hey, you only have two minutes to come up with the answer. So the explanations and the strategies in the book usually don't work. And if you've seen the book, you know what I'm talking about. So many people are saying, okay, well, maybe I need the strategy book. And they go and buy lots and lots of different books or ask their friends for all kinds of books. And the books teach different strategies. And the fun part is that most of these books are written by test prep organizations that just use their books for marketing. You go to the bookstore, buy a book for $20, realize it's really hard, and then go and take a $2,000 course. You know, let's just be honest. This is how the business works. So because of that, because most people just don't use the resources properly, there are lots of very good resources, just there's so many of them. And most people don't know how to organize their studies. That's why a lot of people who begin studying for the test will actually not be successful. Actually, let me show you statistics from the GMAC. About 7 million people a year go to the mba.com website and some of the other websites owned by the GMAC. So this is what, by the way, the GMAC called a sales funnel. If you're familiar with the sales funnel, essentially everybody who is, let's say, going on the website, there will be some prospects. Eventually they're going to buy something. So here's how the sales funnel work. So 7 million people just go on the website, read up about the GMAC. Of them, 2 million people will either buy a book or download a practice test. Of these people, guess how many will actually follow through and do the real test? Only 10%. So only 10% of people who begin studying for the GMAT and create an account on MBA.com will actually end up doing the real test. And guess what? Of these people, about 12% will get scores of 700 or more. So the chance, if we're just beginning to study, if we're just going on some websites and finding out about the GMAT and maybe going to seminars like this, the chance of us to actually get a score of 700 or more is just one in 300. So if we had 300, we have fewer people here, but if we had 300 people here, only one of them statistically will get a score of 700. Of course, all of you can get a score of 700 because I'm gonna share with you exactly how you can do this. So what if instead of trying a trial and error approach, I gave you a map and you just walk into the court maze and know exactly where to turn. And sometimes you'll make a mistake and that's okay, but then you'll continue making your way and you'll be at the other end so much more efficiently and so much more enjoyably and you'll save a lot of time. And let's, let's face it, time's money, right? If I delay my MBA by two or three years, well, every year I could be making maybe $50,000 more. So if I take two years to study for the GMAT, well, that's $100,000 that I'm giving up I'm delaying my life by two years. That's not really something that you might want to do if now is the right time for you to do the MBA. So having a plan is very important. That's why investing in a good self-study program uh, could be a very, very good decision. But if you are the kind of person who's saying, you know what, I'm not going to try to figure things out by myself. I want somebody to show me exactly where to go and make sure I'm on the right track 
and I want somebody to be able to answer my questions, then what you could do is you can take a guided program. If you have a friend or a sibling or a parent or a teacher or a GMAT instructor who can guide you through this, this will be way more enjoyable and probably will end up costing you a lot less in the long, in the long term because you'll be able to get your GMAT faster, get a higher score and get to your MBA program. By the way, I meet, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultations and I meet a lot of people who've been studying for the GMAT for a long time and they are pretty much ready to give up. Many, many people. So this is one of these people, Darini. She came to our program just at the beginning of the pandemic. And she said, I've been trying to study for the GMAT for four years. It just doesn't work. I tried everything. And I said, what did you try? Everything. Okay, what is everything? That every book that was out there, it's on my shelf. I said, well, okay, you know what? Why don't we do this? Why won't we teach you some strategies? Why don't we give you the way to keep track of your progress so that you're not giving up? Because she said, I'm doing the GMAT about once a month. I pick up the books, I try a few questions and I give up because they're just so hard. I feel like I'm stupid. Oh, it's, it has nothing to do about being stupid or being smart, it's about being prepared. So why don't you come, we'll teach you the strategies, you will be prepared, you'll know exactly what to do. Took her about three months. She sent me an email. She planned to do three real exams. She sent me an email after her first exam. And she said, Sergey, I can't believe it. I just walked out of a test center. They gave me a printout with a 700 score on my sheet. I thought that's impossible. So I went back and said, you must have mixed me up with someone else. I can't yet get a score of 700, I'm not ready yet. But you know what, she built this content, she learned the strategies, and she was actually able to get a score of 700 and she just finished her MBA program. So when you begin thinking about the GMAT on a different level, you're gonna do things very differently. Let me show you one more question and then uh, I'll show you exactly the steps to take and then I'll let you go. So here's the question. Aaron will jog from home at X miles an hour and then walk back home by the same route at Y miles an hour. How many miles from home can Aaron jog so that he spends a total of T hours jogging and walking? Looks like a complicated question. The answers are very complicated. Most people are going to be scared of this question. This is definitely a question of approximately 700. So about 10% of people will actually get this question right. Because most people say, okay, so I know distance is equal to rate times time. This person is going at one speed in one direction, another speed in a different direction. We know the time together. We don't know the individual times. So we can build a few equations, but looks like we have three different or four different variables. So by the time we're done, after about five minutes, most people just say, you know what? Let's go to the next question. Maybe I'm going to have more luck in that question. And what, when that happens, when we keep answering the questions incorrectly, the difficulty of the questions keep getting easier and easier. We start feeling better because we're getting the questions right, but we're not getting a good score. So could we get that score correctly very quickly? Absolutely, and if we use our work smart way or the mastery way. So here's what we can do, and you can look up this question, by the way, it is an official question from the official GMAT guide. So we know the distance is equal to rate times time. We always multiply distance by time. If I know I need to drive from Toronto to Kingston and I drive at 100 kilometers an hour, it takes me two and a half hours, I know the distance is 250. So that's what I would always do, right? Distance is rate times time. That's the only thing I need to understand for this question, believe it or not. Because answer choices B, D, and E are trying to add speed and time. That is not possible. It is actually illegal to add speed and time. I want to multiply speed by time. I do not want to add speed and time. So the only two answers that are left would be A and C. Only one of them could be correct. So let me take a look at A. Again, I want to be lazy. I want to look at something that's easier because I don't have that much time. I got only two minutes for this question. It's a 700 level question. I want to do well. I want to get a good score. So I'm going to look at answer choice A. A tells me that the distance will be x divided by y times t. For the record, x and y are speeds. And if I divide one speed by another speed, I would get a ratio of two speeds. I would then multiply this by the number of hours. And I would actually get, as a result, the answer in hours. But I need the answer in miles. Therefore, a is gone. And the only answer to is that's left 
would be C. And I can do this literally in 30 seconds. And this is something that we call the mastery approach to this question because the GMAT is not a test of math. It is a test of reasoning. And if you take the time to learn the reasoning skills, you can absolutely do exceptionally on the GMAT. So how can you do this? The most efficient way to learn your skills is to join a guided program. Just like if I want to learn how to play tennis or if I want to learn how to run a marathon, I would probably have some coaches that will help me. A few years ago, I learned how to sail a boat. It would never occur to me for the life of me to just go on a boat by myself. I just got to crush the boat and it, you know, it's an expensive boat, right? So I took some classes, I learned some theory, how the wind works. Then I got on a boat, but not by myself with some other people that showed me around. And eventually I was good enough. I can go on the boat by myself and I can actually coach other people. That takes time. That's how we develop the skills. So if you are interested to in developing these skills, not just because you want to do well in the GMAT, but because you want to do very well in your business program, consider your GMAT course your first MBA course. You can come and join us. And it's actually going to be a lot cheaper than your MBA program and usually more in depth. So our program, for example, is six or 12 weeks, over 60 hours in the class. We give you all the books, all study materials. I love that Smith, works, Smith MBA works on an all-inclusive model. We work on an all-inclusive model as well. We love working with Smith. A lot of our students went to Smith and did exceptionally well in the program. We just have lots and lots of success stories. We don't really have time. If you are interested, please reach out to me or please reach out to Teresa and she'll certainly be able to show you some of the successes that other people were able to achieve. Our programs are offered either on evenings or on weekends. Uh, we've just started a course on December 3rd. Uh, if you are interested in joining, we can uh, try to accommodate you. We need to talk. We need to understand what have you done so far, whether you'll be able to jump into a program that already just started. But don't worry, we'll give you recordings of the classes that just happened this weekend. Uh, however, for most people, we are now uh, going to be inviting you to join our next program in January. That's going to be the course on evenings. Uh, and then the next, next weekend course will be at the end of January. And just because you came to this seminar, if you go to adminmaster.com forward slash offer, you can actually see what offers are available. And uh, you can take advantage of either our live classes or some of the self-study programs, because sometimes we have clients who cannot join live classes. Like one of our clients lives in Northern Ontario and goes to the mine, to the gold mine for two weeks and can come back, comes back and then stays in town for two weeks. So he can't possibly join a live class. That's why there is this self-study programs. And again, if you go to admitmaster.com forward slash offer, you can see uh, the demos. You can sign up for a free seven-day demo of our self-study program. It's very affordable. There are some discounts. Uh, and if you compare it with other programs that are available on the web on, online, on some of the GMAT forums, uh, you will see that this is more advanced. So we have a lot of our students uh, that are taking this program and many of them write to us and say, wow, I, I didn't even know this program exists. It goes so much deeper than some of the other programs that I found online. This program teaches you exactly the same skills as the live course. It just does that in a self-paced format. So if you go on this adminmaster.com forward slash offer, you will see the different options. You can see what's available. You can see the demos. And I can tell you, look, we keep track of the success of our students. And I know it's not about being smart. It's about being persistent and knowing, learning the right skills. The average score of our students is 670 and about a third of our students get scored of 700 or more. I was actually looking up some self-study uh, self course online just a few days ago. And I noticed that this company claims that the average score of people who take this self-study course is 730 and 92% of people get scores of 700 or more. I'm not gonna tell you what's the name of the company. You can probably find it yourself, but let me just tell you, this is impossible. Absolutely impossible. 90% of people who study for the test don't even take the test. And of the remaining 10%, only about 10% of people get scores of 700 or more. So just, Try to be careful about the sorts of promises that are being given. And I'll be very honest with you. This is a lot of work, but you can do it. If you're really committed, we're really committed to you. How long is it going to take? Well, it might take a long time. Here's a fion. She's actually a friend of uh, Nicole who went to Smith 
did exceptionally well in her program, got a job with Deloitte, now works for a private equity firm. So just a huge success story. Nicole was a nurse, Theon's also a nurse. So Theon, Nicole recommended her friend uh, to come and join our course. And because Theon's a nurse, she can only study maybe like five hours a week. And it took her seven or eight months, but she was able to get a score of 760. So if you're wondering how one's gonna take me, it depends on how much time you have, but she was super committed and she was able to do that. Here's another person. He came and said, look, I'm between the jobs. I got two months, I'm moving to California. I'm starting a new job with Google. I need to get the gym out done now. I put all stops, nothing exists in my life except for the GMAT in six weeks. He took the real test four days after the end of the hour course. He was able to get a score of 760. So that is definitely possible, but it is a lot of work. So ladies and gentlemen, where do we go from here? There are a few things, and I'm gonna launch here a quick poll just so that you can maybe let us know also whether you'd like us to chat one-on-one. -on -one. Our next live class starts on January 10th. It's still possible. We have one or two spots in our weekend course that started two days ago. Come and join us in our refresher classes. There's one next week and one the week after. I would also suggest that if you've never experienced the GMAT, go and take a practice test. You can go on smiths.trygmat.com. This is the website that we have in partnership with the Smiths School of Business. This way you can take a completely free practice test. You can get a report of exactly how you did. You see not just your score, but why did you get this score? And you can see all of that at admitmaster.com forward slash offer. So ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank you for being here tonight or today or this morning, depending on which time zone are you in. Please let us know what's next for you. What I found is that if you're really excited about something, if you really want to take some sort of an important decision or important next step in your career, what would really help is for you to take at least the first step just to show you're committed. And the first step could be go on our website and take a practice test. Or it could be go and sign up for the MBA program uh, or, go, or go and sign up for the, let's say, the mass refresher. Or it could be go on the Smith's website and reach out to speak with the advisors because, as Teresa mentioned, there's no application fee for Smith's. So go and create a profile, start this discussion, review your resume, and start getting some feedback about this very important step. And if you'd like to chat one on one, just let me know in a poll. I'll reach out to you by email. We'll set up some time to chat that's convenient for both of us. And I'll help you out as much as I possibly can. For now, ladies and gentlemen, again, I want to thank you for joining us here today. That tells me you're very serious about your future. So my hat goes off to you. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. I will stay for as long as it's necessary to answer your questions. If you have any questions, please put them in. If you don't have questions now, you know, what usually happens when I go to this thing, I was like, yeah, it's so overwhelming. There's so much information. I'm good. And then like half an hour later or a couple of days later, I'm like, well, I really wish I've asked this question. Do not worry. Just go on admitmaster.com forward slash offer. And uh, you will see a link to join uh, or to register for a one-on-one -on -one consultation on our website, admitmaster.com. This is something that you can book at any time. Uh, just pick the time in the calendar that works best for you and always call us there's a 1-800 number on our website you can always email us i will send you a follow-up email so that you can see uh, how to get in touch with me i will also include teresa's email and uh, the link to the what to the smith's mba website so that you could book uh, reach out for that one-on-one uh, -on -one consultation with the smith's mba program advisors as well so thanks so much ladies and gentlemen and uh, I see that we don't have any more questions. I think it would be time for us to wrap up right now. So thanks so much. Have an awesome rest of the week. I wish you all the best in your GMAT. And I look forward to speaking with many of you very shortly. Take care and all the best.